We're starting a brand new series. It's going to be six parts, and it's going to be all about Mormonism, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the LDS Church, as it's otherwise known. We've been getting tons of questions and emails about this church. Now, we've done our uh, series on the Seven Assemblies of Revelation. We've done our series on the Last Empire of Rome. We just got done with our seven-part series on Roman Catholicism Unveiled. So now we felt it very important to tackle this issue of Mormonism and how it relates to the Bible. Okay, Not so much the organized religion of Christianity, but the scriptures themselves. And this is what we are embarking on, and we want you to stay with us. It's in six parts, and this is part one. All right, here we go. The advancement of Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the LDS Church, as I just pointed out, most often happens by someone knocking on the door. Then, if you're interested, you are probably studying it in private meetings in your home with missionaries from that church. Well, what we are going to review here in these next series of videos is what these missionaries tell you and what they don't. And here are some of the key things that they are probably telling you, followed by what they are not telling you, otherwise known as the truth about Mormonism. All right. The first thing that these, missionary, these Mormon missionaries are going to tell you is this. Mormon, Mormonism began in 1820 when a teenage boy in western New York named Joseph Smith was spurred by a Christian revival where he, where he lived to pray to God for guidance as to which church was true. In answer to his prayers, he was visited by God the Father and God the Son, two separate beings, who told him to join no church because all the churches at that time were false and that he, Joseph, would bring forth the true church now, this event is called the first vision. All right, now here's the truth behind this. The first vision story in the form presented to you was unknown until 1838, 18 years after its alleged occurrence and almost 10 years after Smith had begun his missionary efforts. The oldest but quite different version of the vision is in Smith's own handwriting, dating from about 1832 still at least 11 years afterwards and says that only one personage, Jesus Christ, appeared to him. It also mentions nothing about a revival. The oldest version also contradicts the latter account as to whether Smith had already decided that no church was true. Still, a third version of this event is recorded as a recollection in Smith's diary 15 years after the alleged vision where one unidentified personage appeared, then another with a message implying that neither was the Son. They were accompanied by many angels, which are not mentioned in the official version you have been told about. Which version is correct, if any? Why was this event now said by the Church to be so important unknown for so long. Careful study of the religious history of the local area where Smith lived in 1820 cast doubt on whether there actually was such an extensive revival that year as Smith and his family later described as associated with the first vision. The revivals of 1870 and then 1824 better fit what Smith described later. In 1828, eight years after he supposedly had been told by God himself to join no church, Smith applied for membership in a local Methodist church. Other members of his family had joined the Presbyterians. All right? That's the first point. Now, the second point that the uh, Mormon missionaries are going to tell you about is this. In 1823, Joseph had another heavenly visitation in which an angel named Moroni from the root of where we get our word moronic, by the way, told him of a sacred history written by ancient Hebrews in America, engraved in an Egyptian dialect on tablets of gold and buried in a nearby hill. 
Joseph was told it was the history of the ancient peoples of America and that Joseph would be the instrument for bringing this record to the knowledge of the world. Joseph obtained these gold plates from the angel in 1827 and translated them into English by the Spirit of God and the use of a sacred instrument accompanying the plates called the Urim and Thummim. The translation was published in 1830 as the Book of Mormon, now revered by Mormons as scripture, along with and equal to the Bible. All right, now here's the truth about this. Contemporaries of Smith consistently described him as something of a confidence man whose chief source of income was hiring out to local farmers to help them find buried treasure by the use of folk magic and seer stones, as they were called back then. Smith was actually tried in 1826 on a charge of what was then known as money digging. It is interesting that none of his critics seemed to be aware of his claim to have been visited by God in 1820, even though in his 1838 account he claimed that he had suffered great persecution for telling people of his vision. The only persons who claimed to have actually seen the gold plates were 11 close friends of Smith, many of them related to each other. Their testimonies are printed in the front of every copy of the Book of Mormon. No disinterested third party was ever allowed to examine them. They were retrieved by the angel at some unrecorded point. Most of the witnesses later abandoned Smith and left his movement. Smith then called them, of course, liars. Smith produced most of the translation not by reading the plates through the Urim or Thummim, described as a pair of sacred spectacles, but by gazing at the same seer stone he had used for treasure hunting. Here's what he would do. He would place the stone into his hat, see, and then cover his face with his hat like this. For much of the time he was dictating, the gold plates were not even present, but in a hiding place. All right, that's the end of part one. Thank you for joining us.